Steve, thank you everybody at the Esophical Society, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to um, talk to me about a topic that I I have a lot of passion for, and it, it may seem a little bit curious how someone could be so passionate about uh, death and dying, but I think I'll try to convey to you, or I hope I try to convey to you in my time with you, that this really is a passion for truth, it's a passion for reality, because According to the Tibetan view, this is what's fundamentally re um, introduced at the moment of death. It's really a journey into truth, into reality. And so really in, in my exploration, especially of this kind of Tibetan approach to the end of life, I've come to discover that really this is one of the, personally, one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given and I sometimes playfully say it's a gift in ugly wrapping paper um, because it's wrapped in these harsh, noble truths of impermanence, old age, sickness, and death. And so um, bardo, these bardo teachings, uh, bardo is a Tibetan word that means um, gap, transitional process in between. And it's becoming uh, increasingly available in the popular, even in the public domain. George Saunders wrote uh, his experimental novel um, a number of years ago, Lincoln and the Bardo, there is a movie now um, called Bardo. And for me, as I'll share with you, this extraordinary gift in, in ugly wrapping paper has removed all fear of death. And that's really the greatest gift. Because as uh, Marie Curie, right, only female, only person that I know of to win two Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry, she said really beautifully applies here, nothing in life is to be feared, it's only to be understood. So, but death is just a joke with a really bad punchline. This punchline is called death, but as we'll see, death only exists in the world of form. So we're gonna turn this joke into a good laugh fundamentally. So I'm going to uh, be using the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is the archetypal treatise in the Bardo literature. And I wanna say a few introductory comments about this amazing tome, and then um, in a certain way, translate it for you as a cultural translator. So this particular text, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, really arguably, the, the, certainly in Tibetan Buddhism, one of the most important and famous of all texts, and I would argue one of the greatest contributions in all spiritual and religious traditions. Um, I used to do an annual reading of this entire text for some 10 years. Every single year we get together and we would read the entire book, which takes about seven hours with a little bit of running commentary. But the first thing to understand about this text is that the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, is actually a misnomer. This is a publisher's translation for the Tibetan, which is Bardo Tudro Chenmo, um, which is not exactly the most barn burning title, the great liberation um, by hearing in the between, right? That's not gonna sell a lot of copies. So it was uh, translated originally in uh, 1927. And um, going back to its genesis, it was actually penned. I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell for you today. It was actually penned by this remarkable Siddha um, master. His name is Guru Rinpoche Padmasambhava, um, known as uh, sometimes called the second Buddha, sometimes also called the Tantric Buddha. He was the great individual who was invited on behalf of the King Trisong Detson in Tibet to bring the teachings from India into Tibet. So he's deeply revered in Tibet as really the founder of Tibetan Buddhism. And so what he did was he penned this text, The Great Liberation Through Hearing in the Between in the eighth century as a uh, what's called a treasure text, a terma text in Tibetan, which means it was written um, and then hidden by his spiritual wife, Yeshe Tsogyal, for a time when it would be more auspicious, more, more ripe for people um, to really take advantage of. And so fundamentally in the 14th century, a treasure revealer um, called a tertan in Tibetan, Karmalinkpa literally discovered it, pulled it out of this mountain in Gampadar. And then um, it was translated initially in 1927 by Evans Vlentz. And so I'm gonna do a little show and tell here about the top book. So here's, here's the first translation, 1927. Introduction, interestingly enough, by Carl Jung. He has a very compelling kind of psychological rendering of this amazing text. And since then, there have been at least um, a dozen translations of it, all of them acquiescing to this original mistranslation of the title because it sells, right? 
My favorite translation is this one here. I'm not going to show you all 12, but I'll show you my favorites. This is my personal favorite by Francesca Fremantle, a dear friend of mine, Sanskrit scholar, lives in London, and then the iconoclastic radical teacher, Chikam Trungpa. I really like this one because somewhat similar to Carl Jung's introduction to the first translation, and this one, by the way, was done 50 years after the first one, um, Trungpa Rinpoche gives a really interesting kind of psychological interpretation and rendering of the text. Um, I've read every single one of these. Um, here's another interesting one. It's called the Illustrated Tibetan Book of the Dead. So here's one that's full of wonderful pictures. <laughs> I suppose you could read this to your kids at night uh, if they're old enough. It's kind of an X-rated text, as you'll see. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, well, actually, no, this is the one you should read for your kids. Yeah, the Tibetan Book of the Dead for reading aloud, right? Well, there's another version. And actually, this isn't even a translation per se. This is just one of the many adaptations of this remarkable text, right? So um, here's a, a very playful, interesting Western rendering of it, the American Book of the Dead. For the deeper divers, the scholars, the hidden history of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is actually, for the deeper divers, a very interesting treatise on the origins of this text. And, um, you know, my the second and third really favorite translations, my dear friend Robert Thurman, I teach a lot with him. He's an amazing scholar. He's, this one sold over a million copies. This is Bob Thurman's wonderful translation. And I like this one as well because he does a lot of really sophisticated, elegant running commentary on it. And then the last one that I want to show you, this is really the best translation. This is the, the, the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is the complete translation. And this is by Gurmay Dorje. This is nice because it situates the Tibetan Book of the Dead as one of um, uh, 17 back basically chapters in this great volume. And so for the really deep scholars and divers, this, this is really the best one out there. So, uh, this book has been overtly written as a guide to help people as they're transitioning. It's literally a guidebook to be read, to be whispered, hence the great liberation through hearing. But the, the inner rendering, the inner reason to read this book, and again, do not do this unless somebody asks for it. Even, even if you're a student of Tibetan Buddhism, don't do this unless somebody asks you to do this. Um, but in the event that you do, you can read it as a guidebook for those who are familiar with the text. But the inner rendering of why you might read this, interestingly enough, is that it actually serves to stabilize the mind of the reader, because this is a really sacred text. And by stabilizing the mind of the reader, uh, allegedly what takes place is that as the dying, and I've been around dying people a lot. You may notice this yourself if you work in palliative care or hospice. The dying person's mind becomes um, more porous. In a certain way, it starts to bleed into space. They're no longer so limited, trapped in, in their body. And in a certain way, by, by reading this text, um, stabilizing your mind, uh, the mind of the person who is transitioning is actually attracted to what you represent, stability, because they're losing ground. They're, they're entering this bardo, this groundless space. Bardo is an experience like when the rug of your reality has been pulled out from under your feet. And I'll say more about this later. Bardo is take place all the time. They don't just take place at the end of life. In fact, culturally, globally, the world was in a barter with, uh, with COVID. I mean, that was when the rug of collective reality was pulled off from under our feet. And it's very interesting how we reacted in, in that regard. But as, as a person's mind starts to spill into space by reading this text, the mind of the reader stabilized, the dying person's mind as it bleeds out of the body is attracted to your mind as the reader. And then you can help them um, almost quite literally meditate for them, practice for them, um, is, is this kind of um, wonderful transmission takes place when they start to lose their grounding in this physical reality. So the, the text itself, I'm not sure how many people listening have actually read it. It's a relatively impenetrable text, and that is by design. This comes from the tantras, in particular, the Guya Garba Tantra. And the tantras by design are self-secret. They're really difficult to un um, understand intentionally. They are written in what's called uh, twilight language or Dakini code, which is really code language. And that's why all the tantras require interpretation. The Tibetan Book of the Dead 
requires really deep understanding and interpretation. And so I am not um, a liturgical translator, but I consider myself a kind of cultural translator. Um, taking the essence of this amazing text, which is one I want to do for you today, and putting it into a language that we as Westerners can relate to. Because yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, an American studying a form of Buddhism called Tibetan Buddhism, but I'm not Tibetan. And so for us, the cultural hurdles in understanding this text are formidable. I mean, all the deities, and you, you really try to wrap your mind around it, it's not an easy read. It definitely leaves stretch marks on your mind by design. And so my charter for, uh, in, in the session with you today is to act as a bit of a cultural translator to bring this book into our lives, because close reading of this book, in fact, one of the most famous renderings of it is the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, a close reading of this book will show you that this is uh, written just as much for life. It absolutely 100% applies to any moment of death or transition that takes place in life. The end of a relationship, the, the end of death of a job, a move, any particular situation where transitions take place, where movement takes place, where the ground is pulled out from under you, that's a bardo. And so therefore the great gift of this text is like a fractal. It has the kind of fract fracticality where where the closer you look, the more you read, the more you understand that everything in this text is designed to work with what's happening now in, in everyday life. But so we're going to use, um, what I'm going to do with you is use the archetype, archetypal bardo, the bardo at the end of life, as a way to then extrapolate these insights back into daily life. And so I wanna to return to this thing about fear. And I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna start a little bit with fear. And then I'm going to end my presentation with a more rigorous deep dive about why uh, we're afraid of death. What are we really afraid of? But fundamentally, um, as Marie Curie intimated, we're afraid of death because we don't understand it. We don't actually realize that armed with the right view, we actually have everything to look forward to at the moment of death and really at the end of life. As uh, Rumi put it, one of my favorite poets, death is our wedding with eternity. And so I guess in a playful way, I'm going to use my time with you as a kind of proposal from Buddhism, <laughs> an invitation to unite with eternity. And I leave it up to you um, whether you accept this proposal or not, right? Um, but I want to share ever so briefly the rendering of death from the Middle Ages of death as the Grim Reaper, right? You've seen it, the hooded character with holding a scythe, and he's like really pretty ominous, dark looking character. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of word origins and etymologies and, and whatnot, and I, I kind of examined a little bit this, this representation of the reaper. Well, to reap, there's two fundamental definitions. One reap, a definition of reap is to, to cut, to trim, to remove. And in a very real way, that's what death does. It cuts, trims, removes, gets rid of, as I will try to point out to you, all the fake news, all the adventitious defilements, all the things that are really fundamentally not true. And then what it does through this process of negation, which is represented in the wisdom traditions um, in the East, the via negativa, neti, neti, not this, not that. In the West, in the epiphatic way, the, the, the uh, process of negation, cutting, 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 removing, 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 until um, fundamentally you back yourself into truth in a certain way. And then this is the kind of the second definition of reap. And this, this part of uh, uh, reaping is not grim, this is celebratory. This definition of reap is to harvest, to win, to score. And as I will playfully show with a couple of the meditations that I'll present with you today, in order to win, to score, like they say in the lotteries, you must be present to win, right? So in order to be, in order to win at the end of life, the first practice is to be there fully for it. Um, and that's not always so easy because this is just as a representation of the archetypal of what we don't want, the most unwanted. And it's the last thing we want to do is be, uh, be there. It's like Woody Allen, Woody Allen, right? Famously said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Right? <laughs> so these teachings will equip you with like, wait, hey, right view. I, I actually have something to look forward to at the end of life. So the Buddha understood this when he sat down underneath the Bodhi tree in India. I've had a great good opportunity to be there several times. I've practiced underneath this tree. Um, some 2,600 years ago, he sat underneath the tree and engaged in what came to be called really the supreme contemplation. 
Um, and sometimes it's represented in this phrase, you know, of all the footprints, the footprint of the elephant is the deepest and most supreme of all contemplations. The contemplations on impermanence and death are the deepest and most supreme. And so al allegedly what the Buddha did was he sat underneath the tree and in a, a kind of a 12 step, this is my languaging, of course, a kind of a 12 step detox process. Again, this is the reaping, the cutting away. He stepped his way back. He started at the end. And this is where I have my little honka back here. I'm going to say quite a bit about this. This is called the Wheel of Life, Bhava Chakra. It is without question the most famous religious scroll in all of um, at least India, Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan. This is um, one way to talk about it. This is literally the intellectual content of enlightenment. This is what the Buddha, the awakened one, saw on the night of his awakening. And so we're going to have a little bit of traffic with this because this is a version of the Bardo teachings coming from the earliest schools, what are called the Theravada and Hinayana tradition. And so what the Buddha did was he started at the end. He started up on top with what's called the 12th link or Nidana in Sanskrit. He started at the end with this thing called death. And then fundamentally what he did in a very sophisticated form of analytic meditation, the Pashana insight, he started to look very, very, very closely at this thing called death, like a good scientist. And in this 12-step process, he basically deconstructed, returned. He brought death back to its, its origin, which led him to the very first Nidana, also way up here, which is ignorance in, in the um, Tibetan or Sanskrit, Madigpa, not knowing. Ignorance is that which gives rise to death. And so we're going to talk a lot about that, about transforming that ignorance into wisdom and therefore transforming death into enlightenment. That's really the charter of our journey. But the one thing I want to talk about today, um, specifically I want to emphasize in this Baba Chakra, because we're going to have some traffic with this guy, is the, uh, the entity that holds the wheel of life. He's holding you now, Yama, Y-A-M-A, the Lord of Death. And right now his grip is relatively relaxed. At the moment of death, when we enter what's called the bardo dying, he's going to start to put the squeeze on us, right? And he's what's he going to do if we relate? He's going to squeeze out all the adventitious defilements, the dust, the impurities. He's going to squeeze out um, basically fake news. And basically, he's going to squeeze you into the truth. And so if we relate to this, if we feel his, his embrace, and it may seem somewhat pathological, what do you mean an embrace? How can... Why is death an embrace? Well, if we relate to this squeeze initially as an embrace, being held by the arms of Yama, he doesn't, he doesn't turn into an obstacle. He transforms into an opportunity, an opportunity to reflect deeply now on the truth so that we don't have to really then be so twisted out of shape, literally, when the squeeze is put on us, right? So uh, he is the representation of death. And by... Um, transforming, like I mentioned, by transforming into wisdom, the very first Madonna of ignorance, which is iconographically represented by a blind grandmother. Blindness represents the darkness of ignorance, worn out from giving progeny births to the endless children of, of samsara. I think you know what samsara means, right? It's putting contradistinction to nirvana, the confused conditioned reality that we all find ourselves in. Parenthetically, this is important. Samsara is not something out there. Samsara is not a state in reality. Samsara is a state of mind. Same thing with nirvana. Nirvana is not some state out there. Nirvana is a state of mind. We're going to come back around to this a little bit later. But what we're fundamentally going to be doing, what our aspiration here is, um, by transforming the darkness of ignorance into the light of wisdom, we can illuminate and therefore eliminate death. We can transform the greatest obstacle in life, arguably, what's what greater obstacle is there than the end of life? We can transform death into a quite literally once in a lifetime opportunity. And this really gives notion the real power to the idea of right view. Those of you who are students of Buddhism, you may know that the Buddha articulated his path and what are called the eightfold factors. And arguably the first and most important one is right view. The right view is what we're gonna be working with today cultivating this kind of penetrating insight, this x-ray vision that allows us to penetrate through the darkness of ignorance, where again, darkness is just what? A, a darkness of, of death. 
where darkness is code language for ignorance. And so we're going to replace the darkness of ignorance with the light of wisdom. This then replaces the blind grandmother with what's called the sighted mother of all the Buddhas. And her name is Prajna Paramita. And again, show and tell, I happen to have a picture of her. So this is Prajna Paramita, the mother of all the Buddhas. She's the mother of your awakened mind. And she is also the mother, the lap of the primordial matrix of reality, the mother that you are going to return to, according to the wisdom traditions, not just Buddhism, the mother, the lap of the mother that you're going to return to at the end of life. And so therefore, with the, replacing the blind grandmother with the sighted mother, we transform ignorance into wisdom. We therefore transform, we click, we go forward again. And then in, instead of death, we have awakening. And so that's really the charter of the uh, Bardo teachings in, in particular, and I would argue Buddhism generally, to basically remove these cataracts of confusion, to basically give us this kind of literally insight. This is really the great contribution of the Buddha, by the way. The Buddha sometimes is misattributed that mindfulness and whatnot comes from the Buddha. It does not. The Buddha inherited mindfulness from the developing Brahmanic tradition. But what he did discover is that mindfulness sedates, it doesn't liberate. And that's one of the limitations of the whole mindfulness revolution. Wonderful when a world's on fire to chill out, but mindfulness itself does not liberate. The great contribution of the Buddha is insight meditation, vipassana, or vipassana, if you like the Pali term, penetrating insight. That's what we're going to be working with. And so what I want to do um, to kind of put this view in, in kind of stronger relief is um, play with what the, with, uh, what the Gestalt people talk about is um, the figuration, the process of perception, how perception is always generated in contrast. We see, for instance, if we're reading a book, we see the black page, uh, the letters on the page because it's set against the white background. The contrast is there. So I want to say just one or two words in order to kind of accentuate the power of right view. I want to say a few things about what constitutes wrong view. And so fundamentally, wrong view, and this is a colossal topic, um, archetypally, wrong view is the materialistic view, the degraded reductionist view, where mind equals brain, and where everything, our love, our feeling, our emotions, everything can be reduced. My, my dear friend Ken Wilber talks about this languaging, I love it. In this view, everything can be reduced to frisky dirt. <laughs> let's, just, let's just all degrade it. Let's just all take it to matter. Right, and then everything is epiphenomenal, epigenetic to that. This is major wrong view, and this is why we suffer. If we think that life awareness is just a little island, a, a you know, brief hiccup against this dead, flatland view of lifeless um, reality, then yeah, we have reason to be afraid. But if we understand, and you juxtaposing some philosophical terms, if we understand that that's not the matrix of reality, I'll say more about this when we return to right view. But briefly. If we realize intellectually first through the study, then archetypally, most importantly, through our meditations, we bring it to life. The, the, the world is made of, it's not made of matter, it's made of mind or heart, mind, spirit, love. It's made of the fabric of love. And if you really understand this, which is the radical fearless proclamations, I would argue of all the wisdom traditions, especially the non-dual wisdom traditions, this is an amazing game changer. There's no place you can go that's not mind. There's no place you can go that's not made of love. And so I don't know about you, but if I realize that at the moment of death, when I fall away from fake news, materialistic views, and I fall into reality, I'm falling into a, benefic a beneficent love, kind-held, um, loving reality, I don't know about you, but that's really going to help me relax at the moment of death. And if there's one term, I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize not only all the Bardo teachings, but really all the Buddhism. The only thing you really need to do to attain enlightenment, the only thing you really need to do to have a really good death is just relax. That's it. In a certain way, death is forced relaxation, right? You're being forced to rest in peace. And so we'll see how meditation comes into play here. But we want to replace this degraded um, view, this materialistic, really kind of profane, flatland view, 
with a view made of, of where reality is really made of the fabric of, of mind, heart, spirit, love. Wow, that's a game changer. Then at the moment of death, the only thing we have to do is really fundamentally just do nothing. Do it really well. That's what meditation is. Well, sweet, well, meditation is the art of doing nothing well. Do nothing, do it well, relax. That's it. Death is the one thing you don't have to do. Just get out of the way. Open, relax. That's it. Seminar's over. Sorry, John, I got to go. Bye. Done. That's it. Well, this is what happens. I've, I've given these um, instructions for the years. Usually what happens is I spit something like this out and somebody will say, yes, yes, but. I playfully call it the big but. Because if they say yes, but, then we have this thing called the path. Because it's, it's, it can't be that easy. Yes, it is. It can't be that simple. Yes, it is. And so really all these machinations, what in Buddhism are called the 84,000 dharmas, all the different teachings, all fundamentally circumambulate this fundamental um, instruction is just open, relax, that's it. This is what death is. It's the grand opening. It's the grand relaxation, the grand opening into reality. Why not do that now? So returning to the wrong view, um, basically in this Western view, as you know, and I work a lot with the medical community, I've been with all these physicians. Death is a defeat, right? Arnold Toynbee, the great historian, I'm going to say a couple, uh, I think, playful things. Um, sad but playful, basically said, death is un-American, right? Death is un-American because defeat is un-American. Or my favorite thing, um, Jack LaLanne, I love this guy. I used to watch him when I was a kid all the time, right? Uh, I can't die. It would wreck my image, Right. So this whole notion of death in the West is just a complete ridiculous defeat. But archetypally, this is all represented in my favorite definition, my favorite definition, my favorite rendering. I, I recite this all the time, Dylan Thomas, from his really um, poignant, haunting poem, where he says this, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Well, we burn, rave, and rage because we don't realize that the night is good and that the light is not dying, see? And so my counter, my counter to this is from the Bengali poet, where Brendan is Tagore, my, I love this, love this line, where he says, death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because dawn has come. I mean, it's just really, it's just fantastic. And so playfully, this is what I say here, Dawn only comes for those who wake up early enough to see it. And that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Those who bother to study and practice death, we'll talk about what that really means, while they're still alive. So that's the archetypal wrong view. We don't have to say too much about this because we live in this wrong view. Death is a defeat. We have to avoid it at all costs. No, no, no. Completely flip your relationship to it. Embrace it. Use it as a way to reframe and empower your experience right now. It's amazing what happens when you do this. If you work in, in the care, healthcare physician, is hospice volunteer or whatnot, palliative care, you realize this, that when you frame life with an uh, experience of impermanence and death, it somewhat paradoxically, ironically, it enhances your experience of life. I mean, what did, uh, how's it go? I think it was uh, Samuel Johnson, right? Is that his name? Founder of the first uh, Amer uh, dictionary said, if a man realizes he's to be hung in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind beautifully. <laughs> if you realize that you're held within the embrace of Yama right now, and that you're literally, this is no exaggeration, you're literally one breath away from death. You just have to breathe out, don't breathe in, and that's it. If you really hold this as the supreme contemplation, this is not a morbid pathological morose contemplation. This is a life empowering contemplation. It will empower every relationship. It'll empower every day, every moment, because you realize this could be it. This could be the last time I see this person. This, is the, this could be my last day on this planet. And so those of you who work with any of these, these teachings or work in hospice, you know that these teachings actually concentrate life. We dilute life when we're thinking there's an infinite future. We think we have all these times to live with. But if we actually hold it in the embrace where Yama becomes our friend, it actually brings us more fully. Kind of Yama squeezes life into us if we realize we're held within the embrace and eventually squeeze of impermanence and death. 
So these Bardo teachings, they come from Tantra, the Tantra tradition, or what's also called Vajrayana. And a unique feature of the Vajrayana or the Tantra is that you start at the end. It's, it's called the fruitional vehicle, unlike what are, what are called the causal vehicles, the Hinayana and the Mahayana. And I know I'm spitting out all these Sanskrit and Tibetan terms. Um, I'll define the important ones. If I define every single one, there's too many rabbit holes, we'll get a little bit distracted. But the unique feature of the Vajrayana, and therefore these teachings, is you start with a glimpse of the very end, the fruition, the final goal. And then what um, becomes the kind of the process of the path, Houston Smith, the religious scholar, said this very beautifully when he said the process of the path, summarizing him, is to transform flashes of illumination into abiding light. That's really beautiful. So we have glimpses. We have glimpses of reality, glimpses of truth. And then our, our charter is to stabilize those glimpses, turn them into a steady gaze. And so with that said, the one of my favorite summary verses of the fruitional view comes from a meditation master called Tsangpa. Um, he, he taught in verse, he sang his teachings. And so um, I won't sing it, I'll recite it, but this is really the summary fruitional view that I'm not going to unpack. When it's time to leave this body, this illusionary tangle, don't cause yourself anxiety and grief. The thing that you should train in and clear up for yourself, there's no such thing as dying to be done. There's just clear light, the mother, and child clear light, uniting. When mind forsakes the body, sheer delight. Well, what he's talking about here, you know, the, the, the what's called the mother luminosity, there's just clear light, the mother. That's the mother of your mind. That's Prajnaparamita. That's where you're going when you die. What's the child luminosity? The child luminosity is our level of recognition of this glimpse of the enlightened mind as we're alive. So then what happens is with a little bit of a glimpse of the state now, which is one of the great benefits of the death um, journey. Everything is exaggerated archetypally, according to the Tibetans, seven to nine times. Don't, don't reify the number. These are archetypal numbers. But seven to nine times, things are exaggerated, almost like in a dream, because they're no longer diluted by the illusion of physicality. So things become really concentrated in a certain way. So therefore, it doesn't take much of a glimpse, a moment of recognition for the child to recognize this mother. And so what we want to do with these teachings, and perhaps we can even initiate this growing up process today, is have a glimpse of this initial um, state, this child luminosity within us, so that at the moment of death, we realize it's just, I mean, Paul Simon was onto something, mother and child reunion. It's basically a return. It's a homecoming. I mean, what a beautiful image. You're going to return into loving embrace of the lap of the primordial mother. Uh, that helps me relax. I find it really quite elegant. So this fruitional view fundamentally leads to what we talk about is the, in the title of this program, the death of death. I can't imagine anything greater. Thich Nhat Hanh playfully talked about this, the great Zen master who died a year or so ago. I love this when he said, he said somewhat playfully, we have to, excuse me, we have to replace this ridiculous fallacious notion of birthdays with continuation days. And it's just a, a continuous play, display, recycling of mind, heart, spirit, if you believe in this sort of thing this cosmic rebirth process, which we're going to talk about in just a second, because that ties in very beautifully to what happens with this wheel, this wheel of life and how we get out of it by going in. That's exactly what we're going to be working with. But fundamentally here in the realm of absolute truth, the highest view, there's no such thing as death. Death is a reified construct. Now, the word reification is important. If you don't know what it means, to reify basically means to make real, to materialize, to concretize. There is no original sin in Buddhism, but if there was, that original sin, I would argue, would in fact be reification born of ignorance. And so this is exactly what happens if we are born from the, the blind grandmother. We then reify this thing called death. And we fear it because of what we're doing unconsciously. It's a construct. Death is a reified construct. And as such, it can be de-reified and deconstructed. Like this again, this is what happens when we die. It's a demolition derby. It's taking place as we age, right? It's a slow demo. Just look in the mirror. It's a slow demolition derby as we age. 
So we're being deconstructed on nature's non-negotiable terms, even as we age. As we enter what's called the painful bardo of dying, the first of the death uh, bardos, it's only called painful because it hurts to let go, this demolition derby gets ramped up. Fundamentally, it gets ramped up after age 25 when you no longer really grow in a biological sense. So if death is a reified construct, it can be be reified and deconstructed, and that's the goal. That's the goal. I will summarize it. This is a wonderful, beautiful statement from my dear friend David Loy. Such is the Buddhist goal, to discover that which cannot die because it was never born. Let me say that again. Such is the Buddhist goal, to discover, literally uncover, that which cannot die because it was never born. And so really, that's the chart here. To discover that innermost part of you, right here, right now, the changeless nature, literally, changeless therefore means deathless. This is the part of you that does not grow old, does not get sick, and does not die. It's also called, the, it's the truest part of you. In Sanskrit, it's literally called the Dharmakaya, the body of truth. This, according to the Tibetans, is where you go when you die. You're returning to the Dharmakaya, the body of truth, real news. So playfully, death is only the end if you think the story is about you, the you story. And that's the joke. That's the big joke. Death is only the end if you think the story is about you. It's a you story, sadly, poorly scripted by the ego with a really bad punchline, a really bad ending, this thing called death. So what the Bardo teachings do is offer an entirely fresh new narrative, one that actually never ends. The story just keeps going. Because again, the story is really not about you. Fundamentally, this is what's revealed at the moment of death. This false story is basically pulled away. So death fundamentally, and meditation does this um, more voluntarily as you triturate it, death deconstructs the narrative of the self-sense. And so I always think of this jingle. This comes from the Taoist tradition. This is actually has a lot of truth to it. Why am I so miserable? <laughs> because 99% of everything I say and everything for I, everything I do is for myself. And there isn't one. There isn't one. So what we want to do is, in fact, see the illusion of the narrative structure of the self. See that this thing called ego self is just a form of arrested development fundamentally evolution under house arrest. And therefore, if we can use our penetrating gaze, this illuminating light, we can penetrate through that ignorance, deconstruct the self-sense, de-reify it. And by direct and immediate implication, we de-reify this thing called death. So that's the really, it's another way to talk about the charter. But in the realm of relative reality, so we have to acknowledge relative reality. This absolute view is in fact, from the absolute perspective. From the realm of relative reality, the world of form, Something does obviously end, right? And that is form itself and the level of development that is associated with it. Fundamentally, this is what I this is one of the ways I define ego. Ego is an arrested form of development. Ego is exclusive identification with form. And so basically what's going to happen at the day, at the end of life, at the end of the day, is this house arrest will be released, the ego will be deconstructed. And then if you are prepared with preparation, if you've done this work at the, you know, um, at dawn, so to speak, then you realize that death provides this phenomenal opportunity. The question then really remains, right? Are we going to be ready for this type of accelerated evolution at the end of life and recognize it as an opportunity? If we do, then it will be, and this is the, the most often repeated line in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So remember, I haven't forgotten where all this stuff is coming from. Everything I'm talking about is actually situated within the Tibetan Book of the Dead. But one of the lines is repeated over and over and over, recognition and liberation are simultaneous. Let me say that again. Recognition and liberation are simultaneous. So here's the kicker. We are all going to experience this. At the moment of death, we are going to have a glimpse of the mother. We're all going to, we're going to experience it. The issue is, will we recognize it? How can we expect to recognize something in the darkness of death that we've never met in the full light of day? Without preparation, according to this tradition, that's a little bit unlikely. But by int being introduced to this deathless nature now, 
Then is Kabir, the poet Kabir said of death, what is found now is found then. Or if you're not prepared, conversely, what is not found now is not found then. So according to the Buddhist approach, we will all return to this primordial lap. We will all experience it. For the philosophers, this is called a return to phenomenal consciousness. But will we be metacognitive of it? Will, be, will actually we be able to recognize it? If we do, in this tradition, that's literally called liberation in one lifetime, enlightenment in one lifetime. And then with that sight, with that eyesight, here's the kicker, then the cycle doesn't just stop. You know, it's like I, there's, this, there's this wonderful cartoon from, uh, I hope I bring a little gallows humor into this stuff because otherwise it just gets so serious, right? There's this great cartoon from uh, Gary Larson, you know, um, it shows this man obviously in heaven sitting on a, uh, a cloud and he looks pretty bored. And then there's a little thought bubble above the cloud of, uh, of the guy that says, um, I wish I would have brought a magazine. <laughs> so, so like what happens when you die? Do you just like hang out out there forever? No. Then what you do according to these wisdom traditions is you take your, your x-ray vision, your insight, and then you come back into form voluntarily. See, the point in Buddhism, this is, this is so important. The point in the Buddhist tradition is not to get out of the whole cycle of rebirth. The point is to get out of involuntary rebirth, to get out of rebirth driven by ignorance, habitual um, contraction, um, narcissism, selflessness, selfishness. That's what you want to get out of. What you want to do is create the capacity, the openness to attain lucid death, lucid birth. So then you come back into form, you come back into speech, you come back into action, you come back into body out of love, kindness, compassion, instead of ignorance, blindness, and confusion. That's the, really the charter. The charter is not to get out of samsara, not to get out of rebirth. The charter is to get out of involuntary rebirth. Unless we think, oh, this is, well, this is kind of interesting, metaphysics and philosophy. Well, remember, this is an iterative process. We're talking about what's taking place moment to moment. Fundamentally, we're taking rebirth involuntarily moment to moment to moment, driven by what? Our habit patterns. Our habit patterns. So we want to create these habit patterns, transform them. Habit is just a Western rendering for karma. We want to transform these involuntary, um, darkness-driven, habituated patterns that basically what? They're, they just give embodiments to ignorance. We want to become embodied compassion, embodied love, embodied kindness. And we see this in the great meditation masters from any tradition that um, manifest in the world today. So I want to give you a couple of um, supporting statements because, again, this, this material can be a little bit on the um, concentrated side. This is what happens with the Bardo teachings. It's a little bit using some physics and astrophysics terminology. This is like the singularity of reality. All the teachings, all the Dharma, all the teachings are condensed in, in the Bardo teachings. This is what I've discovered in 30 years of studying it, which is why there's so much here. And so, therefore, in order to help unpack it, understand it more, I love to draw on a number, so much in the spirit of the, the charter that John wrote about the Theosophical Society. I mean, I'll take truth and wisdom wherever I can get it. It doesn't matter. Nobody has a patent on truth. Certainly Buddhism doesn't. And so I love to draw on all these different streams that can support some of these premises. And so here's a couple. One is from a, a dear, dear friend and a wonderful scholar of religion and philosophy, Christopher Bache. Some of you may know his work. Death disappears as an interpretive category because in the absolute truth of oneness, we discover that there never have been any separate parts to life in the first place. So there can never be no death of a part. Here, only illusion dies. That's beautiful. That's what the reaper is trimming away. Illusion, the end of fake news, the end of ignorance. Another supporting statement, again, from Tagore. We are afraid of death because we are afraid of the absolute cessation of our personality. Interesting, persona, my interjection, persona really means mask, right? All the masks that we wear. Back to him. Therefore, if we realize the person, now this is person with a capital P, like S, big S. If we realize the person is the ultimate reality, which we know in everything that we know, we find our own personality in the bosom of the eternal. 
to realize with the heart and mind the divine being who dwells within us is to be assured of everlasting life. When we realize not merely through our intellect, but through our heart, strong with the strength of its wisdom, that Mahatma, or the infinite person, dwells in the person which is in me, we cross over the region of death. Death only concerns our limited self. So that's the only thing that's going to go is, is this arrested form of development, exclusive identification with form. The real you cannot die. It is impossible for formless awareness to die. That's who you really are. That's the, the in his language, the infinite person, which in Buddhism would be uh, the Dharmakaya, which in Hindu, Hinduism would be Turiya, the fourth. This is who you really are. Does not grow old, does not get sick, does not get cancer, AIDS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, not impossible. And if you can transfer your identity from this exclusive identification with form to the true deathless, formless nature of your being, then death loses all its meaning. It loses its interpretive capacities. It's no longer what we think it is. It's no longer what we impute and project it to be, a reified thing that then we're terrified. And I'm going to close with this because fundamentally this terror is fundamentally our projection. We don't even know that we're doing this. So in my understanding of practicing and working with this stuff for years, in particular when I did my three-year retreat, we worked with Bardo Yoga for a really long time where I, I practiced death. And in a very real way, like they say, both attributed, attributed to Sufism, attributed to Christianity, attributed to the Zen tradition, die before you die. You've heard this, right? Wonderful synopsis from whoever said it. If you die before you die, then when you die, you will not die. Wonderful. If you let go, letting go is just a euphemism for death. If you let go on your terms before death's non-negotiable, uncompromising terms, then death no longer has meaning. You've already died. You've already let go. So I've come to look at death as nothing more than a wrathful form of liberation. And it's only wrathful because it's uncompromising and non-negotiable. In Rumi's view, it's the uh, wedding. In the Tibetan view, it's the ultimate homecoming or returning to the matrix of reality, returning to the lap of the primordial mother. But here's the kicker. This is a good kicker. This is a good joke, good punchline. Death does not have to be wrathful. The only thing we have to do is die before we die. Precisely the role of meditation. And so in my estimation, my experience, this is what meditation is. And I think for, for experienced practitioners listening here, isn't it true that meditation is death in slow motion? But I want to introduce you to a, a one really beautiful practice from the tantric tradition that engages in this maxim of the tantra where um, short sessions repeated often, this kind of drip approach, um, are just important and just as efficacious as long sessions. And so, hey, don't get me wrong. I've done a three-year retreat. I go to re I've done years of retreat. I still do retreats. I'm a huge fan of extended meditation. But there's also a near enemy of these extended meditations. This kind of the, the shadow side of retreat is, oh, I can only attain these states when I'm in retreat. I can only cultivate these when I'm in retreat. Well, the tantras say partial, but not complete. The Tantra say, no, you can recognize this right now. You can practice moment to moment right here, right now. So part of the Tantra is, is the immediacy of these teachings, the path of recognition. This is amazing, parenthetically. And I invite you to take a look and see if this is not true. The path is more perceptual than actual. You're not going anywhere. Even at the moment of death, you're not going anywhere. The path is perceptual, not actual. If you relate to mind and reality properly, you're already in a pure land. You're already in nirvana. You're already in heaven. You're already whatever fill in the blank. You're already there. The issue is one of recognition. And so therefore, part of the genius of the Tantra, short sessions repeated often. And so I'm going to give you one, one practice. I didn't make this up. This came from my teacher, Kempo Rinpoche. Those of you who may know this term from the Mahamudra tradition, and it's literally, no kidding, it's literally a one breath meditation. So it's, it's really like what it sounds. Don't let the simplicity belie the profundity. 
for the duration of one in-breath, one out-breath, we're going to practice being fully present, connecting. It's like an instantaneous retreat into the present moment. So eyes open or eyes closed. I like to do them with eyes closed. Close your eye. One breath. That's it. Meditation session is over. <laughs> this is great. If you have a really busy life, oh, I don't have enough time to meditate. Trust me. I know how that goes. Yes, you do. Can you take a breath? Let's do one more. One breath meditation. See, now we've got two meditation sessions in today. I use this all the time. Whenever I'm about, I feel it taking place. Whenever I'm about to take involuntary rebirth into a state of mind like anger, aggression, jealousy, pride, doesn't matter. I feel myself contracting. I feel myself about to take rebirth. This is playfully, this is a type of birth control. Moment-to-moment -moment contraception. Moment-to-moment <laughs> -moment contraception. Birth control. You feel yourself getting upset. You feel yourself about to lose it. Hit the pause button. That's bardo yoga. Bardo is gap. Hit the gap. Hit the pause button. Pause. One breath. We'll do it again. That's it. And then if you like, you can say as a kind of analytic meditation, do I really need to go here? Do I really need to say that? Do I really need to take moment-to-moment -moment rebirth in samsara born from my habitual patterns? Or can I pause, in Buddhist language, stay in the center of the mandala and say, you know what? I don't really need to go there. I don't need to react. I can respond. And then from that space, then you're giving birth to speech voluntarily instead of impulsively. Then you're giving birth to action responsibly instead of reactively. This is the type of speech behavior action that does not create habit, does not create karma. Karma is driven by motivation and tension. So this practice to me, this pause button is, hey, wait a second. What's my motivation here? Why am I saying that? Why am I about to say that? Why am I about to do that? If I'm ruthlessly honest, most of the time, embarrassingly, it's about me. Selfish. Wow, geez, they're offending me. How is this affecting me? It's all about me. Stop. Right? Breathe. Stay open. If you're feeling an uncomfortable situation, feeling whatever, stay with that. This is a wonderful, just to throw a second contemplation in here today, this is um, a wonderful kind of uh, augmentation of this. It's an anti-complaint anti meditation contemplation, deeply tied into this, is that whenever you feel the urge to complain, maybe you've noticed today, just turn on the TV, there's no shortage of things to complain about. Whenever you have the urge to complain, pause. Again, there's Bardo Yoga on the spot. Tibetan Book of the Dead applied to life. You feel the urge to complain. Literally, I'll do this sometimes. I'm literally opening my mouth. I pause. I stop. I wake down. And I ask myself, and this is analytic meditation, Vipassana. What am I feeling right now that I just don't want to feel? And then you stay with that. Stay with that. That purifies the feeling. It doesn't create karma. That feeling is the result of habit karma. If you capitulate to it, that keeps the endless cycle of this wheel turning. If you stay with the feeling and don't act out from it, you start to purify it. So this simple practice is so applicable. It's so disarming. It's so powerful. We'll do it a few more times as we go through my presentation. Short, 
sessions repeated often. Like I mentioned earlier, meditation really is all about letting go, isn't that letting go of our thoughts, letting go of our storylines, letting go of all the things. Letting go is just a euphemism for death. This is what makes the painful bardo of dying painful, is releasing the grip on all these things. But if we start to release our grip voluntarily, if we titrate it, if we do it on our terms, we can start to relax, let go, relax, let go. Do it to such an extent, open, open, open. My favorite definition of meditation, habituation to openness. Open, 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 relax, relax, relax. So that at the moment of death, when you enter the grand opening, right? You can say to yourself, thought bubble as you die, been there, done that. Been there, done that. I've seen this movie before in my deep meditations. And then what happens at the moment of death? You relax. You've already done the work, right? Aging, again, like I mentioned, is, is um, nature's preliminary practice for this. Losing, right? As we age, we're losing, losing, losing cognitive capacities, memory, uh, muscle tone, bone density, hair. I, I mean, you name it. Just look in the mirror. Loss, 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 letting go. Nature is basically inviting and then forcing you to let go. So if we understand that, as Eckhart Tolle says very beautifully here, once again, we can transform obstacle into opportunity. We can see aging as saging. That's the new term. We can see it as, the, as this is a why. This is a really a preparatory practice for the ultimate release. So Eckhart Tolle says this. This is really good. The return movement in a person's life, the weakening or dissolution of form, whether through old age, illness, disability, loss, or some kind of personal tragedy, carries great potential for spiritual awakening. The disidentification of consciousness from form. Since death is only an abstract concept to them, most people are totally unprepared for the dissolution of form that awaits them. When it approaches their shock, incomprehension, despair, and great fear. But what is lost on the level of form is gained on the level of essence. If related to properly, old age or approaching death becomes what it is meant to be. An opening into the realm of spirit. And oh, that's really beautiful. I mean, what did Emerson say? As we grow old... The beauty steals within, right? Not so much about growing up, and now it's about growing down, growing down. I think uh, I heard Marianne Williams say this once that in relation to this, really lovely. The trees in the fall are the most beautiful, right? As we enter the winter, the autumn of our lives, that's when the trees are the most beautiful. And so if we can sage instead of age, we realize the enormous opportunities that await us. But here's again the small print in the spiritual contract. One way or the other, you still have to die. You, this developmental arrest, ego, evolution under house arrest, still has to go. So the Tibetans have a number of general practices that prepare you. The general path altogether is about this. The specific practices like we're doing here, Bardo Yoga. I'll just mention a couple of these just so you have some idea of the scope, what's called Poa or the transference ejection of consciousness practices, then what are called the formless meditations or the completion stage meditations specifically designed to purify death. But the Tibetans don't have, they're not the only ones that work with this. Really, most if not all of the deep non-dual wisdom traditions fundamentally approach these um, transitional processes in highly analogous ways. I want to share with you this um, other meditation that I had in mind that I think could be of some value to us. And this is connected to what I was intimating earlier, that one of the biggest problems we have at the moment of death or in any unwanted experience is really being there fully for it. And so what constitutes a so-called good death is, in fact, the capacity, the willingness, the ability to have a mind and a heart that's big enough. Remember my favorite definition of meditation, habituation to openness, a mind and heart that is so big that in almost a literal way, 
Some what I was talking about earlier, when you're around a dying person, the mind mixes with space. When we're engaging in practices and we're working with the breath and inhaling and breathing out and inhaling and breathing out, in the meditations, the way I was trained, there was always this underlying suggestion of dissolving into space at the end of the out-breath. Exactly the last thing we'll do in this life is literally take one breath out, dissolve into space. Then, while we're still alive, inhaling, bringing that space in. And so there is always this underlying narrative of mixing your mind with space. In the non-dual traditions, very interesting that external space is not the same as the internal space of the mind, but it's also not different. And therefore, we can use external space to work with internal space, becoming more spacious, accommodating. And one reason this is so helpful, especially when situations get difficult, and especially at the moment of life, at the moment of death, is that space has a number of extraordinary qualities. One of which is on one level, it's the softest thing in the world. If you move your hand back and forth through space, there's nothing softer than space. But at the same time, there's nothing more indestructible. You can't burn it, you can't cut it, you can't kill it. So space then for, therefore becomes um, representative of the, the teachings on emptiness. That's where I'm going to be going in a few minutes. Space is a so-called physical analog to the Dharmakaya that I mentioned earlier, which is synonymous with emptiness. I'll unpack what that is. And so if we can, in fact, habituate to openness, where openness, as we'll see, is also synonymous with emptiness. That's what um, openness really means. That's what emptiness really means. Then at the moment of death, we have a mind and heart that's big enough to accommodate anything, literally the ultimate holding environment. And so one way to work with this, I'm going to share with you, I start this practice, literally, I do this every single morning. I invite you to do this with me now. Go ahead and close your eyes. Put your right hand over your heart. And the practice invitation here is to simply open, open to and accept whatever you're feeling right now. It doesn't matter what it is. Radically accept whatever is occurring right now. Be with it 100%. This meditation also doubles as a form of metta, Maitri, practice of loving kindness. And when I do this in the morning is a kind of like a check-in in a quality of acceptance and embrace for who I am and what I'm experiencing. And there is this profound opportunity, really, of I'm okay, right here, right now, just the way I am. It gives me permission to be human, to feel my heartbreak, my pain, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's like a weather check-in. What's the weather like today? Sometimes if I'm really having a hard time, lost, some, something tragic happened, a lot of pain, sometimes I even bring my second hand up like I'm giving myself a hug. It's okay. I'm okay. Just the way I am.
this particular practice cultivated in this capacity in this way will eventually open you to and cultivate kind of indestructible meditation, indestructible mind, heart, that can hold, contain anything like space itself. I'm giving myself space to feel whatever I'm feeling without judgment. Kripalu once said, the Swami, highest form spiritual practice is self-observation without judgment. This becomes extremely powerful when things get rocky and rough, when you get sick, when you're really hurting physically or emotionally, when you're dying. It allows you to be with whatever is happening 100% irrespective of what's happening. Radical love and acceptance towards yourself. Which if you do this actually becomes a profoundly spiritual practice sacred practice for what was previously deemed to be profane, your pain, your heartbreak, your suffering. Keep your hands over your heart. I'm gonna read just a short verse from Trungpa Rinpoche's introduction to the Tibetan Book of the Dead to add extra power to this practice. We could say that the real world is that in which we experience pleasure and pain, good and bad. But if we are completely in touch with these dualistic feelings, that absolute experience of duality is itself the experience of non-duality. Then there is no problem at all, because duality is seen from a perfectly open and clear point of view in which there is no conflict. There is a tremendous encompassing vision of oneness. Conflict arises because duality is not seen as it is at all. It is only seen in a biased way, a very clumsy way. In fact, we do not perceive anything properly. And we begin to wonder whether such things as myself and my projections really exist. So when we talk about the dualistic world as confusion, that confusion is not the complete dualistic world, but only half-hearted. What he's suggesting here is so profound and harks back to what I talked about a few minutes ago about the utter immediacy of, in this case, non-duality, which some people associate, virtually uh, equate synonymous with awakening enlightenment. The invitation here is that if you fearlessly, with an open mind and heart, experience whatever you're experiencing. It does not matter. Don't think that you have to go somewhere else to have a spiritual experience. Simply experience whatever you're feeling, the great equanimity, 100%.
That's how you purify the experience. That's how that experience, whatever it is, reveals itself as non-dual. And therefore, those things, not just death, but other unwanted experiences that previously obstructed you from your version of spirituality, some feel-good, comfort plan, escapist orientation that many of us unfortunately have, getting out of the world of matter and into this world of spirit. No. Go into the world of matter 100%. That is spirit. I personally have found this meditation to be of extraordinary benefit when things fall apart and I'm really hurting. There is no way out. The magic is to discover that there's a way in. Go into form to discover the formless. Go into matter to discover spirit. Okay, thank you. If that resonates and speaks to you, I do recommend, to whatever extent it does, working with this takes just a few minutes. I do it every single morning. And then extending it when things become challenging. Having a mark, heart, mind, big enough that can contain everything, relating to everything fully, Finding non-duality in duality. That's Tantra.